Okay, so yeah, so welcome. Nice to be here tonight with all of you. Um, I think you heard a little bit about my background. So I uh, trained here at Stanford, went to medical school. I've been at the D School for the last two years as a fellow. Uh, I'm currently on the teaching faculty and figuring out Sorry, next. Near, near the mic. Near the mic, okay. Yeah, Gosh, I'm usually like moving around a lot, so I'll try to stay confined to this space. Um, and, uh, and yeah, thinking about next steps, I'm really passionate about the, the interface and the potential for design and health um, as we um, move into the future. So I hope to give you a little insight into the design thinking process as we teach it at Stanford um, and some examples of how um, these two worlds can play nice together. So um, one of the first um, perspectives to share with you um, from the D School is that we really don't um, believe in the idea of innovation being an event. Um, we don't think it's light bulbs going off in individuals' heads. We don't think it's um, people alone in rooms when, and then all of a sudden lightning strikes. We think that um, design is a process, um, um, th th that innovation comes from a series of behaviors, of, of mindsets, um, and working together with people, that you can learn to innovate, that you can um, create situations that make you more likely to come up with innovative ideas. And so that's what we teach our students at Stanford. Um, so this is, is typically how people assault, uh, solve certain problems. You know, it's one person, they have a question, they have a problem, and they come up with a solution. Um, and this was very familiar to me uh, in the medical world because you see a patient and you make your differential and you focus on that diagnosis so you can move forward to the next person. But a lot of our problems and a lot of the problems that we're talking about um, here today um, are not so simple. It's not a, a straight path. They're messy. They're complex. Um, and we think following a process, a series of, of steps, um, gets you to a better, more human-centered solution. Um, and another point I want to make here is that it's often best done with a group of people with different perspectives working together um, as you go through that process. So this is the process, the initial scaffold that we teach students at the D School. Um, I'll just talk briefly about each step. Um, so the first step is to empathize, to actually connect with your users, um, to talk to them, to have conversations, to immerse yourself in their experiences, to observe them in their environments. Then to define your problem. You can't solve everything simultaneously. You have to filter through that information, um, tease out needs and insights, synthesize, organize, and put a stake in the ground, what you're going to commit yourself to. You then ideate. You generate many potential solutions that you will explore. You broaden your solution set and give yourself opportunity to entertain wild ideas, to look at practical solutions, um, and, and really um, push boundaries. You then prototype those ideas. So you make them physical. Um, ideas and discussions are great. Rough sketches um, move the ball forward. But we encourage our students to make physical objects, whether they're designing a product or a service or an experience, whether they're designing something virtual or that will exist in reality, getting it out into the world as soon as possible with the intent of testing those ideas, of going back to your users, getting their feedback, understanding um, the variables that your prototypes are testing. And then most importantly, the design thinking process is not linear. You don't just march through it, through the five steps, and then you're end of, uh, you know, at the end of the road and you kind of, there's a pot of gold or whatever. You use insights from that process to go back again. You do cycles, short cycles, and long cycles. Um, and so as our students come to the D School, we teach them this process and, and most importantly, liberate them from the colorful hexagons to realize that um, everyone has their own design process um, and every field has different ways of working, different tools that work best. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking forward to seeing um, teams that submit ideas to this, um, this contest and how they apply um, their own design process to coming up with, with innovations. So a couple examples. Um, I made this point that you have to pick your problem. You have to focus a little bit. If you try to design for everyone, you often design something that really no one wants. Um, I mean, that might be kind of cool to have on your coffee table, but you're likely not going to pack it with you on a camping trip. So you have to focus. Um, some, some parts of our world really benefit from focusing on averages, from aggregating data, from looking at statistics. We think for a lot of the solutions that will be meaningful and impactful to our users that we can't focus on averages. 
we have to look at individuals. We have to get individual stories, really connect with people, um, understand them on a deep level. And then by understanding those deep needs, we can discover things that are important um, and that have the potential to have broad impact with a larger number of people. So a few stories. So the first one um, is one from outside of the, the D school realm, but we, we use a lot to teach our students about this, um, this process of focusing. So here we have, um, a bunch of you know typical kitchen utensils, um, you know a whisk and a potato peeler, kind of standard issue kitchen utensils. But imagine if um, this was your wife, someone who has rheumatoid arthritis, who has limited mobility in their hands, but really likes cooking. Imagine what it's like for her to use these tools. They're exhausting, they're tiring, they're painful, and they can't do the things that they love. And this was the case um, of an individual who was the head of a company. And so he decided to design something for his wife, for someone who wanted to cook, but the current tools were not um, very applicable. So that's where OXO Good Grips were born from. And this is a product that is larger, more um, delightful to hold in your hand, much more comfortable. Um, you can use them for sustained periods of time. And I see a lot of people in the audience kind of smiling and nodding because this is not like um, rheumatoid arthritis kitchen gear that you find in some obscure store. This is available at Target and there's tons of different products. And this is a great thing for people who have arthritis to use and adults and it's a great thing to teach your kids to cook with. So it, by focusing on the need, by focusing on a user um, and gaining insights about that particular person's life and the way that they worked, um, these designers found a need that actually was more applicable to a broader audience. So the next example I'm going to talk about is actually from some of my own work um, as a medical student and a student at the D School, at the Institute of Design. And one class that I took, we um, were paired with pediatricians um, and our projects centered around young adults transitioning into adulthood. And these were young adults that had a variety of chronic illnesses. So the frame we were given is, you know, 20, 30 years ago, these kids might have died from their conditions. They might have been confined to the hospital or nursing homes or not really Left their, left their homes, not really had independent lives. And now it's great, we have new surgeries, new therapies, medications, tools, and so these kids survive, um, they live into adulthood, but they don't necessarily thrive. They don't necessarily have um, the quality of life that a lot of us in this room enjoy or the quality of life that we would hope someone would enjoy. So um, our particular group um, was looking at kids going to college, starting middle school, getting their first job, and we were here, we were in the bathroom. So our particular patient population was young adults who had different forms of urinary incontinence. So they could not control their bladder. They had to use catheters, urine bags, um, different um, scheduling regimens in order to protect their hygiene, in order to manage um, their urination. And so if you think back to being in middle school or high school or stepping on a college campus, this is, this is the first week of classes here at Stanford, imagine what it would be like to not just worry about your classes and the cute person in your classroom and what clubs you wanted to be in, but always having to think about, well, where are the bathrooms and do I have all my supplies on me and what if people find out before I'm ready? All of these stresses and strains on those users. And we began this process um, with empathy, with connecting with actual young adults who use these products and services, and we heard their stories. They brought in the products that they used. They showed us how they used them. They told us about times where things went well and times where things didn't go so well. We heard about ways that they would hack their products. One individual in particular um, would sometimes take his catheters, which I'll, I'll show you some pictures of later on, he would take them out of the packaging and ball them up and put them in an aspirin bottle and throw that in his, um, his gym bag. So that way, when he was at soccer practice, you know, no one would suspect that he had some other medical condition that he hadn't yet revealed. Um, the same patient told us about a time when he had a new girlfriend and he went to her house for the first time, they had been dating for a couple weeks, and he went to go use the restroom. And like any nice family, they had a powder room with the Kleenex that you know are perfectly fluffed and the bar of soap that's never been used and the trash can that's completely empty. 
So after he goes to the bathroom and he has a big wrapper and a urinary catheter with extra urine in it, he's like, well, what do I do with this thing? I can't just throw it in the trash can. So he put it in his pocket, um, which was not clean for him, which made him very nervous. So we heard these stories about users in their daily lives. And even though before we interacted with these users, we, we were excited to tackle this problem, it put a whole new frame on who we were designing for and why we were tackling these issues. So this is the product that we ended up focusing on. We thought about a lot of different things. This is a urinary catheter. For those of you paying attention, this is actually an indwelling urinary catheter, not the intermittent catheters that I'll be talking about. Um, but the, the point of this slide, which is more dramatic, was why I used it, is that these products were really designed for the hospital. The catheters that our patients take out into the world are the same things that are in the clinics, the same things that nurses use. There's not designed for active, independent adults or young adults who you know, need a catheter at soccer practice. So this is what they have. This is what our users told us about. You know, I go out onto campus for six hours a day. I have to have enough catheters with me to use one every couple hours. I've got to have some backups. What if I drop one? You know, where, where do you put this? Is it in your backpack? Um, do you have a separate thing? What happens if you take a binder out and one of these falls out? You know, that, that was one of the things we heard most commonly. You know, if, if someone sees this on the first day of class, like I'm dead, like no one's going to talk to me, which may, maybe is a little bit dramatic, um, but there's some truth to that, the nervousness and the stigma. Um, I will say that a lot of our users were not necessarily ashamed of their conditions. Um, and one thing that we thought was very insightful is they, they just wanted to have control. They wanted to decide when they told people and how they told people. So um, we were a team of uh, medical professionals. I was a medical student. We had a visiting neurosurgeon from Taiwan. We had two um, MBA students and two engineers. And so after um, gaining empathy from our users, deciding to focus on urinary catheter issues and this, this idea that people wanted to decide how to kind of declare their use of these products, um, we went about brainstorming lots of potential solutions. And where we ended up focusing was, how can we make a catheter more normal? Or how can we make it more like contact lenses or a tampon or a condom? So I remember this day in class, we were starting our initial prototyping. Um, we have some materials in the room. And I raised my hand. And I was like, Are we, can we get reimbursed if we need additional prototyping supplies? And my teacher, um, Jim Patel, who's a, a, a professor over at the business school, he said, what are you going to buy? And I was like, we need a few boxes of condoms. And he was like, I don't want to know. I'll, I'll reimburse you. Just, just go buy them. But this is where we started with very rough and rapid prototyping, hacking existing products. And we asked ourselves, how could we take a big, bulky, noisy catheter and make it small enough that it could fit in the palm of your hand so you could control who sees it and when? And we were inspired by a condom because that's something that maybe if you were like one of our users, if it fell out of your backpack, People might make a little joke about it, but no one's going to kind of raise an eyebrow. Um, it wouldn't be as um, shocking as one of those obviously medically packaged urinary catheters. So part of prototyping is starting with low resolution and moving to higher resolution. So we continued to iterate on our idea, um, eventually got to the stage that we were using 3D printers, um, getting feedback from rapid prototypers here in Silicon Valley, and working through this problem. Um, this is, we, we weren't even this far at the end of class, but we continued on. We um, started a company and we've been working on that ever since. Um, we did some testing on this um, using Stanford facilities. We actually brought in some of our users. Um, some, you know, this is obviously a sensitive topic, so there's only so much testing we can do live, but we were able to use um, mannequins and other things. Um, and most importantly for us, we were invited to um, a camp last summer for young adults who use catheters, who use urine bags. And so we were able to take these prototypes and put them in the hands of our users and get their feedback um, and get questions from the kids, questions from their parents, questions from their siblings, and come up with all sorts of new insights that have really helped to shape our design direction moving forward. So um, my co-founders um, are still working on this. They're actually at StartX Med right now. Um, and they're working to bring this to our patients because we really feel like we, we started with our users um, and found a need that was important to them. And we want to bring that idea back to our users. So the last example I'll tell you as I close out, this is an individual, Doug Dietz, who came to one of our executive education um, training sessions at the D School Three Day Program. This is a picture taken at the D school. He's doing one of our introductory 
exercises. So you see there's like construction paper and pipe cleaners, um, low resolution stuff. And Doug Dietz is an engineer and an engineer with GE Health. So he makes stuff. He designs and engineers MRI machines. So high tech, awesome stuff. He wins design awards, you know, top of his game. He came to this training session and was like, this is cool. Like, I can't wait to go talk to the doctors and nurses and really gain empathy for my products. He was in the MRI suite one day talking to some of the nurses, getting that really good feedback about how crystal clear the images were and how easy the interface was when he was asked to leave because a patient was coming in and needed an MRI. Um, and this was a young child with his parents. And the kid, as you can imagine, was not happy, was kicking, screaming, crying. The parents are stressed. They're essentially dragging the kid into the room. And Doug was like, what? Like, what is going on here? And the nurse was like, oh, this is pretty typical. You know, kids don't, kids don't like the MRI machines. And Doug's like, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, we're going we're, we're gonna to have to sedate the child. We're going to have to drug them so they can get the scan. And at this point, when Doug tells the story, he's like in tears because he was like, I realized that I was a complete failure as a designer because I was not thinking about my end users. I was not thinking about the experience of the kids that were getting in these machines. And so he um, went back to the drawing board. He thought about applying some of the design thinking mindsets and process into his work. And he went to people who understand kids, child psychologists. He went to people who work at children's museums and design experiences for them and really thought about how can we make this scary, sterile environment better for kids. So he didn't actually change the MRI machine, but he designed new experiences around them. <laughs> so this is one example um, where it's like an Amazon rainforest adventure. So now the hallway leading up to the suite is a series of rocks with water. And so instead of the parents dragging the kids, kicking and screaming, the kid is in the front you know, yelling back to mom and dad, like, come on, skip on the rocks or you're going to fall in the water. So like that he's changed who's in control of the entry experience. Now, when they're in this environment, um, it's not a scary machine, but it's part of the adventure. There's one of them that looks like a tent um, and the MRI tech is in a little like Winnebago. And before the, before the appointment, the kid gets a little backpack and is told about his camping trip. So they've reframed this process. Now, another aspect of getting an MRI is that you have to be really still. This is why you have to essentially drug the kids so they don't move. What they've done here is created experiences around helping the kids to remain still. So in this case, they tell the children, well, if you're really still, you might see the fish jump around you. Or in the case of one that looks like a spaceship, if you're really still, the ship will go into hyperspeed. And that's when it makes a lot of noise. So the kids get really excited. Like, Do you see how fast I'm going? So again, this is this is you know design thinking can be applied to to products, to physical objects, but it can also be applied to the experiences that our users have inside the hospital setting, outside the hospital setting. And what we hope from this contest is to see people who connect with the users and derive meaningful needs by focusing on those users, and then design something that. Um, can be impactful and really, really change their lives. In this case, hospitals that started using this type of MRI experience, their sedation rate went from 70 or 80 percent to maybe one or two patients a year. So by doing that, they've reduced the risk for these kids, they've reduced the stress on the parents, and they've actually been able to increase the throughput of the MRI suite. So wins for a lot of people. So I encourage people who are going to be submitting designs to um, use these as inspiration, and those of you who are in this space, think about ways that you can collaborate with people and bring human-centered design into your work. Thank you.